us this evening. Thank you for coming out. How many of you have seen a presentation like this before? Oh, good. Good. Many of you. All right. If you haven't, this is, it's, it's extremely impactful. Um, we were privileged to have this years ago, and uh, it's, it's amazing to see how the plan of salvation is here. So... Uh, let's pray together, and then I'm going to introduce Larry and let him take it from there. Father God, thank you for a chance to come together to uh, be in your presence, to be with your people, to hear what you have already prepared for us. Father, we pray that you would speak to Larry and through Larry in ways that change our hearts, that encourage and strengthen us, that deepen our relationship with you, and make it so that we can share you better with those around us. Father, we ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Larry, I'm just going to let you take it. Thank you. Well, shalom and good evening. Shalom. It's a blessing to be with you. Pastor Dwayne, welcome to the Tri-Cities area, and thank you for giving me the chance to be here. It's made the trek all the way from Jonesboro tonight. <laughs> yeah. 
Got through that commuter traffic just fine, left a little bit early. Now, it's really great to be here. Listen, always, always, always a pleasure to be with God's people, uh, old friends and some new faces, but a privilege, and especially on a day like today, a night like tonight, Good Friday, to be together to remember and rejoice in the sacrifice and also celebrate in the resurrection of our Lord prior to Resurrection Sunday. It's a privilege to be with you. What I want to do tonight is I want to share a little bit of God's grace in my life. Some of you know a little bit of my story. Others of you I've not met before. But uh, Jesus and Jewish did not go together growing up. You see, I'm the son of a Holocaust survivor. My grandpa Carl served in World War I in the German Army with a gentleman who would later become an SS agent. This man was a friend of my grandpa Carl, becomes an SS agent. My father escaped Nazi Germany in the spring of 1939. This man put his life on the line and enabled my father and his family to escape Nazi Germany, falsified papers. <laughs> they made their way to Belize. Uh, back in the day, it was British Honduras. And eventually, 11 months after they escaped von Germany in 1939, they immigrated to Daytona Beach. And there, he met my mom in Florida, and I was born there in, in Florida. Our family reformed Jewish, reformed Judaism, a liberal expression of Judaism. Religiously and spiritually, we were not so connected to God, but culturally and socially, very connected to the Jewish community. But interestingly, I always believed in God, and I believe that somehow he knew me and that I was special in his eyes. But we as believers in Jesus Christ, we understand that there is a God-shaped void in every human being, and that God-shaped void can only be filled by the Lord Jesus. In high school, I thought I'd fill that void with accomplishment and achievement. I was a state-ranked tennis player in Florida. I was a good student. I thought making good grades, winning tennis matches would fill that void, and it did not. I attended a university down in Gainesville, Florida that shall remain unnamed. <laughs> I'm already going to test your grace quotient, okay? <laughs> I'm a gator boy, but I'll, I'll refrain from any gator chomps tonight. But it was at the University of Florida that I thought I'd fill that void with the party scene. I thought worldly pleasure might make me happy. Obviously, it made me more miserable. In fact, I was that person walking in quiet desperation. I'd put on a happy face. You probably know some of these people. Hey, how you doing? I'd put on a happy face and say, I'm doing fine. No, I wasn't. I was empty inside. I was lost. Jesus was not the way to be found. And yet, in my college years at Florida, people started coming into my life telling me Jesus is the Messiah, that he died for my sins and rose again from the dead, that through faith in him I could be forgiven. I could have a reason to get up in the morning. I could experience abundant and eternal life. I didn't want to hear that. Jesus, we were taught in the synagogue, was the God of the Gentiles. He was not for us as Jews. But the Holy Spirit kept moving, people kept coming. There was a buddy of mine named Greg, we were both in the journalism department at Florida, and he began witnessing to me. And he made a statement and posed a question that rocked my world. He said, there's absolute truth and you can get in touch with it. I was like 19 years old, I'm like, that's a little bit heavy. Then he said, do you know where you came from? Do you know who you are? Do you know where you're going when you die? I was like, stop. <laughs> the Holy Spirit used those words to rock me. And that sent me spiraling into what we might call an existential crisis of sorts. And I started searching. I didn't necessarily embrace my Judaism. I didn't embrace Christianity. But I began to investigate and search out different worldviews and philosophies and religions. Because, again, I knew I was lost. I knew I needed something. I didn't know that something would be a someone. Fast forward on my journey, a year after I graduated from Florida, this is a few years later, September 1987, I'm reading a philosophy book by a guy named Will Durant. And a gentleman sat next to me on the airplane, all wide-eyed. He looked over, he said, oh, philosophy book, are you interested in philosophy? And I had to arch my back and say, yeah, yeah, I am. He said, great, man, let's talk. I've got a master's degree in philosophy. And you might find this hard to believe, but he actually did most of the talking. <laughs> and he began to share his faith in Jesus with me. 
He said, I've tried this, that, and the other. He said, who I've ended up with is Jesus. I thought, who? <laughs> who? Strange words, man, is what I thought. You see, nice Jewish boy, well, at least my mom thinks so. I attended a liberal Catholic high school for academic and athletic reasons, and obviously not for religious or spiritual reasons, but I, I say that to say this, I knew about religion. He was not talking to me about religion. He was talking to me about a relationship with the living God. And then he said, hey, you tell me you're Jewish and you believe in God? I said, yeah. He said, well, then why don't you ask your God as you know him? Why don't you ask the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob if Jesus is the promised Messiah? And he'll show you. Well, I was 23 years old going nowhere fast. I was at the end of my proverbial rope, and I was searching, and I realized this wasn't a coincidence. There was Greg, and there was another guy in college uh, was witnessing to me, and there were too many coincidences, and I realized this wasn't a coincidence. And I, I actually took him up on his offer, and I said, I can do that. He gave me his business card. He was a traveling insurance salesman from Owensboro, Kentucky. He said, call me if you want to talk. I'll be praying for you. And I got off the plane that afternoon in early September 1987, and I prayed a deep theological prayer. I said, God, help. <laughs> Anybody relate to that kind of a prayer? I said, I don't know about Jesus, Messiah, the Bible, Christianity, but I believe you are real. And if you are and he is, show me. Bought a New Testament. Most Jewish people who don't know the Lord, many are forbidden, especially in Orthodox circles, from reading the New Testament. I'd never read it in my life. It didn't come alive to me. He wrote down some scriptures in Hebrews and Romans on the back of his card, and it didn't come alive to me. But things started changing in my life. I stopped partying with my friends. I thought a clear mind would be a good thing. Stopped clubbing. And I started listening to classical music. That was a really big step for me, by the way. <laughs> and something else happened. I was experiencing more joy and peace in my life as I was cleaning up my external act. And I was searching. I wanted to know. And I would start to see things driving to and from the tennis club I was coaching tennis at that I'd never seen before in my life. I'm tooling down the road, and I start to see license plates and billboards saying things like, God loves you. Jesus loves you. And I thought, this is strange. What is going on here? And what was going on was the Holy Spirit was in the process of revealing himself to me. And this experience culminated three months later, now early September 1987. Jeremiah 33, verse 3, the word of God speaks these words. God speaks through the prophet even today these words. Call unto me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things you know not. I didn't know, but I prayed a prayer of faith. And that afternoon, I realized the source of this joy and peace on St. Petersburg Beach welling up within me was not coming from Larry, it was coming from God. And then I had an aha moment. Anybody here ever have an aha moment? I had the greatest aha I ever had. You see, in one moment, I once was blind, but now I can see. I once was lost, but now I was found. In a moment, in the blink of an eye, what Greg said was true, what this guy Steve Titchener on the airplane rang true, what these other people had told me about Jesus, it rang true in my heart of hearts, I believed. And I drove home trying not to get into an accident. And I called this guy up that I met on the airplane. Steve, Steve, I believe, I believe. What, what happens now? He's like, slow down, man. You're a little excited here. And some of you who know me know that I can get a little excited here. And I prayed to receive Jesus Christ and actualize what God had already done in my heart. And I'm eternally grateful for the Lord for transforming me and bringing me out of darkness and into light. Hey, to be real, I was on the road to perdition. There was no doubt in my mind I was on the road to perdition. And by 30, I would have been dead and in hell without Christ you know, saving me and bringing me out of a reprobate life. So God has blessed me with a beautiful wife and kids. Uh, I was a tennis coach for 14 years professionally. I was actually a burned out tennis coach in Florida. And so, you know, tennis coaches in Florida, tennis clubs and academies, you know, 50 weeks a year, six days a week in the Florida sun, you know, and a friend of mine said, you know, you've always wanted to coach in college. So why don't you try to get a college coaching job? And I thought, 
okay, fall break, spring break, winter break, summer break, and you know what I mean? I, I, I needed a break, you know what I mean? So God brought me up to East Tennessee in the early 90s, 1991, the fall of 91, I came to coach tennis at East Tennessee State. That's how I made my way up here. Well, there happened to be an, another Jewish, uh, not another Jewish guy, but another guy from St. Pete, a guy named Dave McCauley. Anybody know Dave? A lot of you know Dave. Well, the Holy Spirit began giving me a burden to share the gospel with my Jewish people here in the early 90s. And I'm thinking to myself, this is an interesting to, place to bring me. You know, there are not many Jewish people here in East Tennessee. And I thought to myself, well, Moses was in the desert 40 years. And you know, what's, what's, what's my destiny? Well, Dave McCauley had a prayer group. I was part of that prayer group on Wednesdays, Tuesdays or Wednesdays. And I told the group, I said, start praying for me. I think God's going to bring me into some kind of ministry to Jewish people. And in God's grace and in his providence, he did just that. Um, there was a guy who ended up marrying Lori and I. I'd seen Jews for Jesus. I'd seen their music team, which I was a part of in the late 90s, called the Liberated Wailing Wall. They preached the gospel through music, drama, and testimony. Anybody ever seen that group ever? Okay. If you haven't, just picture in your mind, Fiddler on the Roof meets Jesus. Okay. That's kind of... <laughs> I'd seen them, and they were good. And I, I called Jews for Jesus, and I called the recruiter, and I said, I want to do a short-term mission trip, summer campaign in Chicago and New York City for the summer. And he said, hey, would you be willing to be a part of our music team? And I think I wrote down guitar under hobby. You know, I'm not a musician. I, I played like three, four chords, you know. I could do singles groups, like, you know, shine, Jesus, shine. You know, G, C, D, rinse and repeat. That's what I knew. I told this guy, I said, I'm not a musician. And then he posed a question that, that rocked my world, that if we're honest, we'll rock our world. He just made a, a simple, seemingly benign question. He said, are you willing to make yourself available to God? I was like, whoa. And I did the Christian thing that you do sometimes when you don't want to deal with it. You say, I'll pray about it, right? <laughs> Disingenuously. I said, yeah, yeah, whatever. Later, I did found out after I was accepted to the team that the only requirements, it didn't matter how good a musician you were. You had to love Jesus and be able to fog a mirror. And if you could do that, you qualify. They could teach you the music part, okay? Well, after a few months, I, after a few months, I, I, Went to Jim Thickley, some of you know Jim. I went to Jim and said, Jim, can you record? He said, I can help you. So I recorded three songs. And like Sarah in the Bible, I just sent my demo tape off an application. And I said, I'll get accepted probably to the summer witnessing campaign, which is six weeks. I wanted to do short term. This music commitment was for two years. I just laughed. I said, whatever. A few months later, he called me back. He said, the recruiter, Stephen, said, he said, hey, you've been accepted to the summer witnessing campaign and you've been accepted to the liberated whaling wall pack your bags i was like what and you might find this hard to believe but i was actually speechless i was like you lost for words really i want to be a fly on that wall right i was blown away i was like no so in june of 1997 i moved away from johnson city and I had a 29-inch hard shell suitcase. I had a book bag. I had a guitar, an acoustic guitar. And I got on an airplane to go to Chicago to train at Moody Bible Institute and then spend the month of July in New York and then move to San Francisco and train to be part of this music team. And my, I'm the first Christian in my family, mind you. And my mom goes, so where, where are you going? I said, well, I'm going to Chicago, then New York, then San Francisco. She said, well, who are you doing this thing with? I said, I don't know. She said, and where are you staying? I said, I don't know. <laughs> she said, are you going to be a Hare Krishna? It's like, no. You know, <laughs> she realized years later it was okay. But I didn't know. I just walked by faith, and, and it was transformative. I moved away, and then I joined the music team, did the summer witnessing campaign, met my wife, Lori, in ministry, and then came back. We got married in 1999, did two years of ministry full-time. You know, in the Torah, there's a verse that says, soldiers don't go out to war for a year, right? Stay home. So it said, hey, when you're telling Jews about Jesus, that's spiritual warfare. You know, we know we're, all of us are in a war, right? But when you're telling Jewish people that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to God except through him, that's warfare. 
So we took a break. We moved here to East Tennessee, and then God in 2003 called us again from tennis and coaching into full-time ministry, now in New York City. My wife and I moved to New York City. And I was a full-time missionary there in the Big Apple for six and a half years. Problem was, I was working a burnout schedule, my two kids young, growing up without dad. I was away two, three months a year, and I said, I gotta take a, I gotta take a break from this train. And I took a one-year sabbatical. Tom Euler, you remember Tom at Grace Fellowship, my home church. He said, there's always a place for you to come. So I left the ministry in New York and came here and served on staff at Grace Fellowship Church in Johnson City for four years in missions and outreach. And that was great culturally. It was a great fit for my family, but it wasn't great for me because I'm weird, okay? And I had interacted and interfaced with the body of Christ around the world. Any kind of evangelical expression you can imagine, I have interfaced with them as a missionary. The, all those years with Jews for Jesus. And so I felt constricted. I said to Tom and, and Tim Bowers, I said, I really feel I need to be doing something else. And they, helped, they sent us to Dallas. And we did lead at Dallas Seminary. Uh, it's a program for people, missionaries who've been on the field a number of years who don't know what they're going to do when they grow up, right? And that was, that was us. And so in 2013, Grace Fellowship in Johnson City was so graceful to us and helped us start Larry Stan Ministries, which I'll tell you a little bit more about during our break. So that's a little bit and a little taste of God's grace in my life. And like I said, I'm eternally grateful to the Lord for all he's done for me, for all he's doing for me and all that he will do for me. The promises of God uh, go on and on and on. And by the way, newsflash, the future is bright for you and I as Christians. Now we know it's a bumpy ride in the here and now. Can I get an amen? amen. But the future is bright and it could not be brighter. So with that, are you all excited to see this presentation? Yes. Okay, I'll tell you a little bit more about the ministry later on and what we do. But for now, let's talk about Christ and the Passover. Now, if you were to ask some Jewish boys or girls who the hero of Passover is, after giving credit to the Lord, they will certainly tell you Moses. And that is true. But it's not the whole truth. You see, if you were to ask some Jewish boys or girls who know the Messiah, like our kids, Elijah and Shoshana, that same question, who is the hero of Passover, then they might tell you Jesus. Now, some people might say, probably not anybody in this room, but some people might say, Larry, what's Jesus got to do with Passover? Passover is Jewish. Well, so was Jesus. Duh. My wife doesn't like it when I say duh. <laughs> But Jesus actually celebrated the Passover every year while he dwelt among us on this earth. And I believe Jesus is clearly pictured in all of the symbols of Passover and in the story of Passover itself. For the message of Passover is the promise of redemption. And the story of Passover is the story of our liberation from bondage. Tonight, as I explain to you all this traditional Passover setting, it's my hope that you'll see it as much more than just an explanation of a commemorative meal, but that you will view it as I view it, as an object lesson of the life and mission of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Look closely, brothers and sisters, because I believe that you're going to see a picture of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. So if you have a Bible, I encourage you to turn with me to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, we're going to read verses 7 through 13. And as you're turning there, just know that Passover, Easter Sunday, this Sunday, Passover this year is Monday night, April 22nd. The two different calendars that we have creates that disparity. But Luke 22, we're going to read verses 7 through 13. <coughs> Excuse me. Beginning in verse 7, we read, Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. So they said to him, Where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Then you shall say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? 
Then he will show you a large furnished upper room. There make ready. So they went and found it just as he had said to them, and they prepared the Passover. The first night of Passover begins a seven-day holiday called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And during that time, we eat nothing that contains any leaven or yeast. Why no leaven? Well, in the scripture, leaven is frequently used as a symbol of sin. In ancient times, a small piece of leaven would be used to ferment an entire portion of dough. It was the leaven that caused the dough to rise, to become puffed up, just as sin can cause us to become puffed up in our own eyes. So during this time, we eat no leaven as a way of saying that we want to break the daily sin cycle in our own lives. That's why in some Orthodox Jewish homes, for up to six weeks prior to Passover, the house will undergo a complete spring cleaning. We'll remove all the cakes, cookies, bread, cereals, anything that has any leaven in it. Now, this is usually the work of the woman of the house. But did you notice that Luke says that Jesus sent two men to prepare the Passover? Perhaps he sent two men because in Judaism, it's the man who has standing before God, not only when it comes to prayer, but when it comes to ceremonial preparation as well. So if you think about it, this means that the man should be doing the cleaning during these six weeks. <laughs> And all the women said, Amen. Amen. But don't worry, gentlemen. We have a great way to deal with this dilemma. <laughs> we have a great answer to the problem. It goes like this. Now true, the home is spotless and the woman has spent the last six weeks cleaning and removing every speck of leaven. Well, almost every speck, that is. You see, she's taken a few crumbs and she's hidden them somewhere in the house. And it's up to the man to find them. So the night before Passover, he'll return home and take up some rather strange looking cleaning tools, including a napkin, a wooden spoon, and a feather. And he goes on what we call Berichat Chametz, the search for leaven. Now, where could those crumbs be? Anywhere in the basement, up in the attic, behind the refrigerator. But fortunately enough for him, She's been good enough to hide them exactly where she hid them the year before and the year before that. And you get the idea. Nice wife. And all the gentlemen said, Amen. Amen. Finally, the husband will discover the crumbs and he'll sweep them into the, in the crumbs into the, with the feather. Remember, since the crumbs represent sin, he's not permitted to touch them. Instead, he'll wrap them up in this napkin and in some traditions, actually take it down to a bonfire in the courtyard of the local synagogue. There, all of the men will then throw their bundle of leaven into the flames. Then he'll return home and proudly proclaim, Now I have purged my house of all leaven. But just to be certain, he'll add, And all manner of leaven which I have neither seen nor removed be considered null and void and as the dust of the earth. Amen. Well, the house has been cleansed and the home is now ready for the Passover celebration. And it is a celebration. But my ancestors were instructed to eat that first Passover meal with their loins girded, with their sandals on their feet and with their staves in hand, ready to go at a moment's notice. But tonight, tonight we relax and recline on pillows. You see, in ancient Middle Eastern societies, only the free could recline at dinner. Only the redeemed. On Passover, the head of the household is going to put on special ceremonial garments. He'll wear a white robe called a kittle because in Jewish tradition, white is the color of royalty. He'll also don a large white headdress called a mitre. I know many of you in here are Jewish savvy, so if you know what I'm wearing, blurt it out. What is this? Yarmulke. That's right, it's a yarmulke or kippah. Jewish men will often cover their heads as a sign of respect before God. But tonight, instead of wearing the usual yarmulke or kippah, the head of the household puts on something a little bit more elaborate. Royal robes and symbol of a crown. Because tonight, the head of the household is a king. And as a king, he's going to guide his family through the traditional Passover Seder. Now, Seder is a Hebrew word which means order because the Passover celebration follows a specific order of service. 
And that order is recorded right here in this book called a Haggadah, a Haggadah, which means the telling, the telling of the Passover story. Well, I see everything is about ready. We have a customary greeting at Passover. We say, let all who are hungry come and eat. Now, don't get excited. Not really going to serve you a great meal tonight, but just the same, the invitation stands. Come, celebrate the Passover with me. This begins with the lighting of the candles, and this is usually the duty and honor of the woman of the house. After lighting the candles, she'll then recite a traditional Hebrew prayer, which goes like this. <clears throat> Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has set us apart with your commandments and commanded us to light the Passover lights. I think it's fitting that a woman kindles these lights, for it can remind us that the Messiah, the light of the world, would not come from the seed of man, but from the seed of woman. As the prophet Isaiah foretold, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and glory of thy people Israel. Now, friends, I want you to know something tonight. Passover is much more than a meal, okay? It's actually a banquet. And it's much more than a service. It is a ceremony. And while a meal and a service might take just one or two hours, the Passover celebration may take a total of up to four hours. So let's see here. 8.35. <laughs> Dinner plans, anybody? Just kidding. <laughs> Actually, during the Seder, each adult will drink from his or her cup and refill it four times. You didn't know what you were getting into, did you? <laughs> Actually, the first cup is called the Kiddush cup or the cup of sanctification. Then we have the second cup, the cup of plagues. Then the third cup, the cup of redemption. And the cup of redemption is actually the focal point of the entire evening. Then we have the fourth cup, the cup of Hallel, or the cup of praise. It's with the first cup, the cup of sanctification, that the host will offer a blessing for all the rest of the evening to follow. Raising the Kiddush cup aloft, he'll give praise and thanks to God Almighty, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Bore pri hagafen Amen The Seder has begun and the youngest person present will come forward to ask the meaning of Passover. He or she will ask the traditional four questions which are found in the Haggadah. They are chanted and the first one goes like this. Which means, why is this night different than all other nights? Those of us who know the story of Passover were obligated to respond. This is because of what the Lord did for me when he brought me out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, when he redeemed me with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Friends, understand that redemption is the very heart of Passover. But Passover imparts much more than God's message of redemption. It imparts God's means of redemption through the sacrifice of a Passover lamb. My ancestors were instructed to take a spotless lamb, to roast it whole without breaking any of its bones, and to apply its blood to the doorposts of our homes. To the top of the doorpost, the lentil, and to the two side posts. Because of our obedience to God's command and because of our faith in the effectiveness of his provision, we were spared the ravages of the 10th plague to befall the land of Egypt. For when the Lord saw the blood on our doors, he forced death to do what? That's right, to pass over. In Hebrew, we say Pesach, Pesach. Try saying that with me, Pesach. Hey, good job. We got some Hebrew speakers here. Well done. Pesach. 
the holiday which commemorates the time when death passed over the houses of Israel because of the blood, the blood of the lamb, the Passover lamb. What a mighty act of redemption. But what a picture, what a picture of an even greater redemption accomplished through the sacrifice of another Passover lamb, the lamb of God, our Messiah and Lord Jesus. For just as none of the bones of those first lambs were broken, so none of Jesus' bones were broken in his death. And just as my ancestors had to apply in faith the blood of the lamb to the doorposts of their homes, so each one of us must apply in faith the blood of the Messiah to the doorposts of our hearts. Amen? Amen. The child will then proceed to ask another question. Why on this night do we eat only unleavened bread, matzah? And we explain our ancestors in their haste to leave Egypt had to take their bread with them while it was still flat. One of the items I want to show you now is this one. This is called the matzotash. And inside the matzotash are three layers of matzah, each layer separated from the others by some cloth. Now on Passover in a couple of weeks, the head of the household is going to remove the middle layer of this matzah the unleavened bread. He's going to then recite a blessing and then break it in two. He'll set one half aside and give the other half a very special name, the afikomen. The afikomen. Can you say that with me? Afikomen. Very good. It's not a Hebrew word, by the way. It's actually a Greek word, which means that which comes later. And that is precisely what happens. We do not eat the afikomen yet. We're going to eat it later. But for now, what we're going to do is we're going to wrap it up in this napkin. And then it's going to be hidden from view, buried. No one at the table knows where it's hidden. But later on, all the children are going to have to search for it and find it. Or the Seder cannot continue and conclude. So at this point in our evening's festivities, I need all the children to stand up. Because I'm going to give you a chance to find this off you coming, okay? And I brought a really cool prize. you got to stand up. Now face the back of the room and close your eyes because I've got to find a creative place. Any other, any takers, any young at heart want to play? Okay, you all. I've got to get really creative and hide this off you coming. It's always a challenge to find something creative. Where am I going to hide it? Let's see. Music equipment? No. No, let's don't do that. Oh, wow. This is a tell. The top is on. We're not going to play the piano. Uh, we won't play piano. Don't look at the piano. It's not there. Okay. Let's see where I also can do. All right. I found a place to hide it. You all can turn around, open your eyes. Can you wait a few minutes? Patience is a virtue, you know. <laughs> but listen, in a few minutes, I'm going to call you up, okay? And I brought an awesome prize all the way from the big city, okay? Not New York City, Johnson City. But it's really, <laughs> you're going to... You're going to really like, you're going to like this prize, okay? I assure you. In a few minutes, I'll call you up and it'll be your time to shine, okay? So you all can take your seats for just a little bit before I call you up. Now, the child will then proceed to ask two more questions. Why on this night do we eat only bitter herbs? And why on this night do we dip our food twice when normally we do not even dip it once? Let me explain by showing you this. This is a Seder plate, and despite its appearance, it is not used for deviled eggs. <laughs> I like deviled eggs, and I like cheesy jokes, and some of you are probably thinking, good thing this guy's a minister and not a comedian. But the first item we have, the first item we have is called carpets or greens, and by the way, shout out, Gala, where are you? Raise your hand. Thank you so much. She helped me get all the elements, so thank you very much for doing that. The first item we have is called carpets or greens. Generally, we're going to use parsley or lettuce. In this case, parsley. These greens represent life, but before we eat them, we're going to dip them into salt water, which represents the tears of life. So by dipping, we are reminded that a life without redemption is a life immersed in tears. I remember my life without redemption. Can you remember yours? 
Next, we have the chazeret, the root of the bitter herb. Generally, a horseradish root or an onion, in this case, an onion, the chazeret reminds us that the root of life is bitter, as it certainly was for my ancestors in Egypt. Next, we have maror, the bitter herb itself. Freshly ground horseradish, and this is freshly ground horseradish. <laughs> now on Passover, we're instructed to eat a full teaspoon of horseradish. Any volunteers? <laughs> Do you all know what happens when you eat a full teaspoon of horseradish? That's right, you cry. You have little choice in the matter. Now, this is a battle between the horseradish and your sinuses, and guess what? The horseradish always wins. <clears throat> but we kind of like that here at East Tennessee, springtime, you know, allergies. We call this stuff Jewish Dristan, you know what I'm talking about? It's good stuff there, good stuff. But like the, like the Chazeret, again, the Maror brings to our minds how bitter life is without redemption. By way of contrast, now we have the Haroseth. The Haroseth represents the mortar that our ancestors used when they had to make bricks for Pharaoh in Egypt. Generally, it's made up of chopped apples, raisins, honey, nuts, and it tastes wonderful. But maybe you're thinking, why use such a sweet mixture to represent such bitter toil? Don't worry, we have a terrific answer. We explain, even the most bitter labor is sweetened with the promise of? Redemption, that's right, redemption. That's it, redemption. This is not an Easter egg, although Easter's coming up this Sunday. This is actually called the Haggigah, originally the name given to the special temple sacrifice in Jerusalem. Today, the Haggigah takes on a whole new meaning for my people. Today, it's actually a token of grief, grief over the destruction of the second temple. During the Seder, it's broken open, sliced, given out to each person at the table. And before we eat it, we are going to dip it into salt water, which represents what again? Tears. That's right, tears. But it's not only a token of grief, it's also a symbol of new life. The last item on the Seder plate, probably the strangest of all, is called the Zeroah. The Zeroah is the shank bone of a lamb. Passover is sometimes known as the feast of the Passover lamb, and yet in most Jewish homes at Passover, roasted lamb is not served. You say, well, why is that? Well, remember a moment ago I mentioned the temple was destroyed in 70 AD, and when it was, so was the altar where the sacrifices were offered, where those Passover lambs were offered. So from that time to this day, no lamb is served at Passover. Instead, this roah, like the egg, the hagigah, reminds us of sacrifices which are no longer offered. Now tonight, the presence of these two elements, the egg and the shank bone, raises for us a very, very interesting question. With no temple, with no altar, and with no sacrifice, how is it possible to atone for our sins? For the law of Moses states very clearly, I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Now some people, both Jewish and Gentile, might say, you know, maybe that was important 2,000 years ago, but it doesn't really have any bearing on our lives today, does it? Doesn't it? Yes. If not, then why does the Haggadah instruct us to take the story of Passover personally? as though each one of us were being brought out of Egypt. I think that we're supposed to take the story of redemption personally because each one of us needs to be redeemed. But with no sacrifice, how is redemption even possible? With no Lamb of God, how? Once, nearly 2,000 years ago, there lived a Jewish man by the name of Yochanan. You might know him better as John. John the Baptist. And one day while baptizing people in the Jordan River, his gaze fell upon the form of another Jewish man, his cousin, a man named Yeshua. We know him better as Jesus. And John gazed upon Jesus that day and he uttered these powerful and profound words. He said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 
That's how redemption, not through the blood of lambs, redemption through the blood of the Passover lamb, the lamb of God, Jesus, our Lord. We now come to the second cup, the cup of plagues. In Jewish tradition, a full cup represents complete joy, but in one sense, our joy is not complete. At this point in the Seder, what we're going to do is dip our finger in the cup, and we're going to let 10 drops fall onto our plates as we recite the 10 plagues that were poured out upon the Egyptians. Now, we mourn their loss, and we express sorrow over their destruction. There's a very important lesson in this cup. Pharaoh defied the will of God. He was repeatedly told what God wanted him to do, but his heart was hardened, and he said, Nope, I refuse. I will not. As a result, he brought death and destruction not only upon his land, but even into his own home. You see, Pharaoh's son died because of his hardness of heart. Now tonight, right here in Elizabethan in East Tennessee, I think about my life. You all think about your lives. How often do we choose our desires over God's direction? How often do we know what God's will is for our lives? But how often do we say to the Lord, Lord, it's too hard, Lord. I can't do that, Lord. I'm sorry. Let me give all of us a little piece of Jewish wisdom this evening, okay? If God is telling us to do something, that's right. Just do it. And for you sports fans, go Vols tonight, right? Just do it. But as I've said, Passover really is a night to praise God and thank God. And I'm going to praise and thank God on Passover because the angel of death has passed over my ancestors' homes and because the Lord has redeemed my people out of bondage in Egypt. But you know, as a personal, on a personal note, as a, as a believer in Jesus Christ since 1987, I'm going to praise and thank God not only on Passover, but I'm going to praise and thank the Lord every day of my life because I have been redeemed from an even greater bondage, the bondage of sin. Through faith in him, each one of us may pass over from death unto life. Is that good news? Yeah. That's the best news. In Hebrew, the word is Besorah Tovah, which is a Hebrew word which means glad tidings or good news from which we get the word gospel. At this point during the Seder, there's a natural break between the second and third cup where we actually partake of the meal. Now, growing up in St. Pete, Florida, whether we would stay home or go to the synagogue, we would eat a roast brisket, a roast chicken, never had lamb for the reasons I mentioned to you, matzo ball soup, everything kosher, of course, right? But I want to take this natural break just to briefly introduce you to Larry Sand Ministries. As I mentioned, we started in 2013. Lori and I began Larry Stamp Ministries, and our ministry exists to make the gospel of Jesus a confident topic of conversation for every Christian. I want you to know, I didn't share this in my journey to Jesus story, but you need to know that not one time on my faith journey to salvation did I step inside the halls of a church, that I listen to or watch a Billy Graham online or a Greg Laurie, didn't, didn't, didn't go talk to somebody um, that was religious. Young people, I didn't go online. There was no online back in the day. I know some of you might find this hard to believe, but there was no <laughs> online. It was through the faithful testimony of people just like you out in the marketplace that God used to bring me to a saving knowledge of himself. I mentioned Greg in college. There was a guy, Herb Woodall. I tried to sell television time one summer, hung out a summer with Herb. He was an ABC sales affiliate, and he sold television time and hung out with him, and he spent a whole summer telling me about Jesus. There was this guy, Steve, on the airplane I mentioned. God used people like that. And so I've got a real burden to help God's people lean in and into your own unique spheres of influence and be more effective witnesses for Jesus Christ. Because here's the deal. We know in our culture today, less and less people are going to church, right? So it puts more of an onus on the individual Christian to step into your unique spheres of influence. Because here's the deal. You know people that I will never meet. You have people in your unique sphere of influence that are lost and need Christ. And God has placed you strategically, just like Esther, for such a time as this. So that's our charge. And we teach Jewish roots of the Christian faith like this to help you all better understand the gospel. And we call it building gospel foundations, teaching Jewish roots, because I believe that the, the better that we understand the gospel message,
the more effective we're going to be in sharing it with others. Amen? Amen. So to that end, we do a variety of things. I speak, I teach, I write. I try to be an example of a witness. I do a little bit of street outreach here in the Tri-Cities, a little bit of prison ministry. I, I serve one day a week as a chaplain with an organization called Marketplace Chaplains USA. I serve four businesses in five East Tennessee locations. Uh, so I get to do a lot of different things. I can speak at conferences. I'm kind of like a missionary on call. That's how people go, what do you do? It's like, I'm a missionary on call. I'm not on a church staff. I'm not a missionary with a missions organization. But I get to go where God calls me to go. I'm kind of like nimble, you know. I'm not an aircraft carrier. Some of you have been part of ministry aircraft carriers, right? Hey, you should change this. It's a good idea. It doesn't work like that, right? But, but we're a little speedboat. So the Lord calls us to go here. That bit of it opens up a door there. So that's kind of what we do. So we write, we speak, we preach, and we do a lot of other things. Some of the equipping resources we have are we have free resources like this pamphlet. And I have a whole literature table over there. Get some freebies like this one. It's called Pointers on Witnessing. Uh, I encourage you, if it looks good over there at the literature table, take it. It's free. We've got free, sources, free resources like that. We've got some not-so-free resources. By God's grace, I penned three books. This is our third book. We published it a couple of years ago. It's called Jewish Roots of Christianity, A Biblical Survey of Redemptive History from Genesis to Revelation. This is a book that will build gospel foundations in your life, okay? Here's just a brief tidbit of what this book is about. So you remember in 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul wrote in verses 3 and 4 these words. Remember, he wrote, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Remember that? It's a foundational verse in the New Testament. Of what scriptures was Paul referring? That's right. The Old Testament, the Jewish Bible, the Hebrew scriptures. So we should be able to find substitutionary atonement. Christ or Messiah died for our sins and was buried and rose again on the third day. We should be able to find resurrection also in the Hebrew scriptures. The first three chapters of this book actually are the gospel in the Old Testament. That's how important it is. I put the most important stuff at the beginning. But there are other cool topics as well, like the Trinity in the Old Testament is a really fascinating study. That's a whole chapter. The Old Covenant versus the New Covenant, that's a study. We study the covenants as they pertain to salvation. Israel, its place, God's redemptive key, right? No Israel, no Messiah, no Messiah, no redemption, no hope. You, you get the deal. But this is a really great book to better understand the gospel message. And we've got a book on personal evangelism over there and also a book called End of the Gale that deals with how do we live victoriously amidst increasing persecution. A couple of other notes I want to tell you. Uh, we send out a once a week devotional that will help you in your witness. If you want some encouragement in your witness, we send out weekly a devotional about a thousand words or so. We also send out a once a month communique to apprise you of our comings and going, what God's doing in the ministry. One more exciting thing I'll mention with you before we get back to the Christ and the Passover is I had the privilege of going with Southwest Radio Ministries. Anybody familiar with Southwest? There were five Bible teachers, including myself, and we went to Israel and Jordan. We were in Israel for 10 days, Jordan for two days last summer, late, late August and early September. And I had the privilege of being able to record content for a 10, 25 minute video series in video. They're trying to get it on television. It's called Pilgrimage to Zion, Salvation Studies in Israel. I was telling Pastor Dwayne earlier, we're coming down the home stretches. Uh, we're in the final editing stages and it's gonna be released, Lord willing, sometime in May. So that's something, if you sign up for our, sign up for our e-updates, we're going to let you know how you can get that, where it may be platformed and all that good stuff. But I was telling Pastor Dwayne earlier, it's like the most significant project I've ever been involved with as far as teaching goes, because the production is going to be above and beyond anything I've ever been involved with. So looking forward to that. That's also a gospel study, obviously, salvation studies in Israel. So that's a little bit of our ministry. And one more thing I want to share before we get back to the presentation if you've got somebody in your life who's lost, who needs Christ, and you want prayer for them, 
Come talk with me afterwards, share their name and any other details you want. We're a small ministry, so we have the opportunity to be praying for you and for them. And we have a network of partnering churches. I send out a once a month communicate of partnering churches who stand with us in prayer as well. So you could increase your prayer network for those in your life who are lost and need Christ. Good? Okay, we ready to get back to the Passover Seder? But before we start, that matzo ball soup, huh? What do you think? Was that matzo ball soup the best you ever had or what? Come on, come on, come on, come on, you know. You're supposed to say, yeah, Larry, it was really good, okay? Mama only makes the best. But we're gonna get actually back to our presentation now. And remember we talked about the third cup, the cup of redemption, which is the focal point of the entire evening. But the Seder can't continue just yet, young people. This is your time to perk up because something is missing. Earlier, something was broken, buried, and now needs to be brought back. Do you all remember what it is? Help them. What's it called? It's that funny Greek word, the afi. What's it called? The afi? That's right, the afi komen. It's now your time to find the afi komen. So come on up. It's your time to shine. Who's going to find the afi komen? Who's going to win the prize? Who's going to be really, really, really happy? <laughs> now, don't be bashful. It's underneath something, so you've got to look underneath stuff. Okay? We're getting warm. Could get it warm here. Could be really warm. Yes! Good job. Let's give everybody a big hand, but the winner stay up here with me. You all, good job. Good job. Give me a high five. Good job there, kid. Okay. You give me a high five. Good job. Young lady, give me a high five. Good job. Good job. Winner, stay up here with me. Now, I was a tennis coach for a lot of years, right? You got to give me a high five. Now, what's your name? Caleb. Caleb, give me a high five, buddy. You ready for your prize? Now, you remember the horseradish that we discussed earlier? In the, in the, in the, remember? remember? You, you remember that? Okay, that's not your prize, okay? <laughs> I wouldn't do that to the boy. Now, close your eyes. I got a prize for you, okay? Check it out. Here we go. Ready? Open your eyes. A golden dollar, a shiny golden dollar for you, my friend. There you go. You take that and you hand me the Afi Komen and we give you a big hand. Good job, Caleb. Let's give it a big hand. Good work, buddy. Give me a high five again. You can take your seat with your golden dollar. Good job. Isn't that awesome? I'm not a big fan of the horseradish. I only eat it one time a year. And you all are smart people. You can figure out when that is. <laughs> but the afikoman, when it's found, and it's a big deal to find the afikoman, usually money like that, chocolate, okay? It's really an honor to find that afikoman. And once the afikoman is found, it's returned to the head of the household, and then each person will receive a piece of the afikoman about the size of an olive. And that olive-sized piece is then taken along with the third cup. <clears throat> the cup of redemption. Look familiar, anybody? Yes. Don't worry, I won't say duh again, okay? <laughs> won't do that. This is the origin of our communion service, okay? But not only that, I want you all to consider this. Where else can we find a clearer picture of our Messiah, Jesus, than in this custom concerning the Afi Komen, which was broken, buried, and then brought back? Even the matzah itself, which is unleavened, a symbol of a sinless nature speaks of Jesus. Our rabbis have set down very specific regulations concerning the preparation of matzah if it's to be found suitable for use. And one of these is that the matzah must be pierced. You see those holes? Jesus was pierced. God speaking through the prophet Zechariah said, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Take a look also at the line. See the stripes on the matzah? The prophet Isaiah wrote 700 years before Christ walked this earth as a man about the saving work of the suffering servant on our behalf in perhaps the most powerful messianic prophecy in the entire Old Testament, Isaiah 53. The prophet wrote about Messiah that he was pierced for our transgressions and by his stripes we are healed. Praise the Lord for the suffering servant. Amen. Amen. But I see our Messiah symbolically not only in the Afikoman, I also see him in the Matzatash as well. Do you remember this pouch containing the three layers of matzah from which we drew the Afikoman? 
Now there's quite a bit of disagreement among our rabbis about the meaning of this strange pouch, this mysterious three in one. And the spiritual antennae are going up. I can hear it now. Mm. Now there's quite a bit of disagreement among our rabbis about, this, about the meaning of this strange pouch, this mysterious three in one. Some teach that the matzahs represent the three patriarchs of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But why is the middle matzah broken, buried, and then brought back? Still others teach that the matzahs represent the three divisions of worship in the ancient kingdom, the priests, the Levites, and the people of Israel. But again, why is the middle matzah broken, buried, and then brought back? Still others teach that the matzahs represent three crowns, the crown of learning, the crown of priesthood, and the crown of kingship. But once more, why is the middle matzah broken, buried, and then brought back? In the Jewish community, even today, the origin of this tradition has been lost. That's why there are so many competing explanations. But there's actually another explanation which has its roots in the first century. And it brings to my mind the words of God given to us through Moses who declared, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. The Hebrew word used for one in that sentence is Echad, a unity. And on Passover, the head of the household is going to remove the middle layer of this Echad, this unity. It is made visible while the other two remain hidden from our view. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus, the bread of life. We Jewish people who know Messiah know also that the unity of the Matzatash bears witness to the unity of one God revealed in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so once more the question must be posed. Why is the middle Matzah broken, buried, and then brought back? I believe because Jesus was broken, buried, and then brought back. This is my body which is broken for you and you and you and all of us. Do this in remembrance of me, our Lord Jesus tells us. We now come to the third cup, the cup of redemption. The fruit of the vine at Passover is usually read, our rabbis tell us, to remind us of the precious blood of that first Passover lamb sacrificed in order to redeem us from slavery and bondage to Pharaoh. In the same way, the blood of another Passover lamb, our Messiah Jesus was sacrificed in order to redeem us from bondage and slavery to sin. It was concerning this cup, the cup of redemption, the cup taken after dinner, that Jesus would later say, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for many for their forgiveness of sins. He spoke of the new covenant promised to us by God through the prophet Jeremiah when he declared, Behold, days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. After those days I will put my law within them and on their hearts will I write it. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. The broken piece of Afikoman is taken along with the third cup, the cup of redemption, in remembrance of the body and blood of the Passover lamb. Friends, tonight, my Passover lamb is Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. Amen? Amen. But we now come to the fourth cup, the cup of Hallel or the cup of praise. Now, everybody in this room knows a Hebrew word, but I wonder if you know that the word is Hebrew. And the word is hallelujah. And it means what? Praise God. Praise God. Praise the Lord. First part of that word is hallel, which means praise. And this is the cup of praise. Well, there's one more cup I want to close our time with tonight. A very important cup. This is the cup of Elijah. No one drinks from the cup of Elijah. In fact, in a matter of weeks, on April 22nd, on a Monday night, in thousands upon thousands of synagogues and Jewish homes around the world, 
an entire place said he will be left untouched. All for the prophet Elijah. And you say, why? Why this longing for the prophet Elijah? Well, it's recorded by the Hebrew prophet Malachi that before the Messiah comes, he will be preceded by the return of Eliyahu Hanavi, Elijah the prophet. And so every year at Passover, a child's going to go to the door and open it wide, hoping that the prophet will accept the invitation, enter the home, and announce the coming of the Messiah. Well, I've got great news for us tonight, late March 2024 in East Tennessee. I know that Elijah has returned. For when Jesus spoke of the prophet John, he said of him, if you care to accept it, he himself is Elijah who has come. The prophet, the forerunner of the Messiah has come, and so has the Messiah himself, Jesus, the savior of both Jew and Gentile. Yeshua, Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 Did you learn some stuff? Amen. Were you encouraged and inspired? Yes. Anybody hear something they never heard in church before? Raise your hand. Don't be bashful. Yeah? That's the goal. Well, listen, it's really been a privilege and a blessing to be with you, especially on this Good Friday time. And come see me in a moment after we close our time here. But I want to conclude our service with the ancient Hebrew blessing known as the Aaronic Benediction. It's taken from the Torah, the book of Numbers, chapter 6. And I'm privileged to be able to pray this blessing over you. I'll sing it in Hebrew, and then I'll say it in English, and then we'll conclude our time. And once again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Each and every one of you, it's been a blessing to be with you as well. So will you close your eyes with me as we close our time tonight? And the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron that this is how you shall place my blessing over the people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. B'Shem Yeshua Mashichenu Sar Shalom, in the name of Jesus, our Messiah and Prince of Peace. Amen. Amen. Have a great rest of your night. Come say hello.